As I've stated many times before concerning the topic of slavery in America, African peoples and their descendants resisted enslavement every step of the way. According to the sources, they did this in diverse ways. It was different from region to region with varying degrees of effectiveness, the most obvious being the taking up of arms. Other forms were sabotage, damage, escape, and more. However, one form of resistance seldom discussed in popular culture that offered the ultimate reward with little to no consequence was the process of the enslaved suing their master for freedom. What up African world, it's Home Team here and welcome back to another video of African history, culture, and worldview. By supporting this channel on Patreon, you're helping in the creation of these videos and contributing to this content. The link to Patreon is in the description box below. Enslaved Afro-descended people in North America were not myopic in their approach to finding pathways to freedom. Seemingly, all avenues were considered, and they were ready and willing to sacrifice. I think we often hear of the violent ways in which enslaved Africans chose to liberate themselves. However, there were numerous cases, especially in early America, where enslaved peoples used the law. Via hindsight, the irony is that the early law of the land could both enslave the African and also liberate him. While America was beginning to form its identity, it struggled deeply with cognitive dissonance. In one hand, people came to the country to liberate themselves one way or another. This was a very potent value set. However, they had to do so in the face of an obvious contradiction. The paradox of this American dilemma did not go unnoticed amongst foreign visitors. Two Frenchmen visited America in 1831. They traveled to most regions throughout the country and wrote about their experience. It was an intellectual tour of sorts. Interestingly enough, both men simply could not ignore the glaring societal contradictions. In the United States, they found that the rule of law coexisted with savage violence. They discovered throughout America a broad equality of manners and deep inequality of wealth. Most of all, they were astonished by the coexistence of freedom with slavery and equality with racism. Surely it is a strange fact, Beaumont wrote that there was so much bondage amid so much liberty. Frenchman Gustave de Beaumont expressed what I believe to be a perfect distillation of the time, so much bondage amid so much liberty. This paradoxical complexity naturally found its way into the American court systems, opening up loopholes that many Afro-descended people were able to take full advantage of. One of the most salient examples of this was the case of Elizabeth Mumbet Freeman of Western Massachusetts. Elizabeth Freeman was severely abused by her master's wife and brilliantly sought a pathway to self-liberation. She left the house and went to a lawyer asking him if she could claim her liberty under the law. The lawyer, Theodore Sedwick, inquired as to how she even came to such an idea. According to Theodore, Elizabeth proclaimed, the Bill of Rights said that all were born free and equal and that, as she was not a dumb beast, she was certainly one of the nation. Theodore Sedwick was seemingly impressed with her cogent response and decided to take her case to the Berkshire County Court in 1781. Mumbet won her freedom and became a living legend in Western Massachusetts. This woman was not only incredibly brave to pursue this endeavor, but to intellectually defend her position, successfully using the rules of a nation against its own backwards interests, was impressive. The fact that W.E.B. Du Bois was her great-grandson says so much about her legacy. In his writings, he honored her and claimed inspiration from her story. While Elizabeth utilized the intellectual significance of the Bill of Rights, other enslaved Africans used small loopholes in the law to acquire freedom. In 1846, Josephine v. Pulteney of New Orleans sought to take advantage. For some background, in 1846, the state of Louisiana caught on to the strategy of some enslaved individuals to win their freedom, enacting a law that essentially stated that no enslaved individual can win their freedom even if their masters took them to live in a free state or a free country. 
Josephine, an enslaved woman in New Orleans, was taken to New York and Philadelphia in 1841 and was on free soil for years. Upon returning to New Orleans, she sued her master because she was on free soil before 1846. She won her case and her freedom, but her master appealed to the Louisiana Supreme Court. Despite the appeal, Chief Justice at the time, George Eustis, wrote his decision confirming Josephine's freedom. The operation of the laws of Pennsylvania upon the personal condition of the plaintiff by a residence acquired in the state released the plaintiff from the dominion which the defendant had over the person of the plaintiff as a slave in Louisiana. Her condition once being fixed, she cannot be reduced to the condition of the slave. Her subsequent return to the state cannot restore the relation of master and slave. The courts in other states were seemingly open to enslaved individuals suing for peace. In Massachusetts, we have an estimate of how often this may have been happening. Altogether, between 5 and 10 percent of African slaves in Massachusetts gained their freedom before 1775, in many cases, by their own efforts. The 5 to 10 percent were perhaps not all deemed a legal process, but at the very least, it gives us a general idea. In 1765, an enslaved woman named Jenny Slew accused her master of unlawfully taking her with force of arms. This accusation at the time was obviously laughable to her master, John Whipple. He didn't even take the court process seriously. The judge apparently didn't either. Jenny was ordered to remain in slavery and even required to pay cost. But Jenny obstinately pursued freedom. Her case was brought to the Massachusetts Supreme Court by Benjamin Kent. The Salem jury brought in a verdict for Jenny Slew, and the High Court ordered her to be set free. It also required her former master to pay damages of nine pounds and cost of four pounds. The future president of the United States, John Adams, was paying close attention in the courtroom. Apparently, this case made an impression on him as he wrote about it in his diary. He writes, This is called suing for liberty, the first action that I ever knew of the sort, though there have been many. I find it interesting that John Adams happened to witness the case. Also, he claims that the process of suing for liberty was no aberration, as he mentions clearly that there have been many. It's safe to assume that in these many cases, according to John Adams, Afro-descended men participated as well. These are stories we don't often hear about. Though some Afro-descended people undoubtedly lost some cases, the significance of the individuals who won is worthy of note and recognition. Moreover, even the option to do so is striking. In my personal opinion, this history speaks to how people of African descent deeply impacted ideas of freedom and liberty in America, helping to shape and mold it into the moral ideal it seeks to become today. Well, I'm all out, guys. If you like these videos or want to help in its continued production, consider supporting the home team on Patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace.